Well, hello, that's me again. Today is the January 2nd of the year 2023. And yeah, that's basically a new cycle, a new year of my videos. And I want to address today a um, thing of which uh, Brian Berletich and guys of, from Duran were speaking about, about uh, NATO getting involved directly in the uh, conflict in Ukraine or trying to counter special military operation because obviously they have all reasons to be to be worried about uh, it and um, I will start with the pretty trivial statement NATO is already directly involved in the conflict in Ukraine be that actually numbering tens of thousands of the so-called volunteers very many of who not all but very many of who are the cadre officers and soldiers of the NATO countries especially Poland and obviously like even today the popular uh, Russian uh, portal or resource of Zglad, which I use, for example, only as the news aggregator, posted today a very good article about direct one of the parts of NATO's direct involvement, and it's about how the uh, air-based uh, intelligence, uh, ISR basically of NATO, tries to spoil the operations for Russia. And it's a long piece which describes all kinds of the assets which are directly used in order to provide their uh, tactical and operational awareness for the armed forces of Ukraine, or rather what's left of it. And it starts from all kinds of Boeing E3A Sentry to RC-135 to Swedish and other British uh, assets which deal with the issues of the intelligence, reconnaissance and surveillance, with also helping <coughs> Ukraine somehow to, uh, you know, if possible, deal with the issues of Russia's, which is uh, uh, ongoing right now, now, which amounts to a strategic bombing, if you wish, a missile strikes campaign, and which is ongoing now for uh, in earnest for the last week with the increased intensity. And that is why, for example, Ukraine, for the most part, knows when Russian cruise missiles launched, be that from the strategic aviation or uh, from any other uh, launchers be the, like, for example, Bastion or Iskander, they know that they are flying. You do not necessarily know when they act, actually where they will fly, but you will know that they are flying and that gives you some time to prepare. Now, there is another uh, issue, of course, here that, uh, that also, the especially electronic, deep electronic surveillance, including uh, by space-based assets, which are not so much NATO as the United States, States, allows uh, the um, allows the armed forces of Ukraine, but in essentially NATO to plan some kind of strikes similar to what we saw, like those three pin pricks in the last uh, months and a half against the base of the strategic aviation in Engels near Saratov, with all those. Uh, 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 UAV is basically based on the TU-141 uh, uh, Strish, uh, a Russian, uh, well, Soviet actually, drone shut down, but this allows them to, for example, see the electromagnetic spectrum picture in the European part of Russia, and that allows you to basically plan the uh, ro route, route of the uh, drones trying to uh, assault the uh, bases, air, air bases of the Russian strategic aviation. Well, if this is not a direct involvement, of course, yeah, it, it is. But there is, of course, another thing which everybody talks about right now, not least Douglas McGregor himself, that NATO may, uh, well, let's separate immediately. NATO, when we say NATO, basically it means um, the... Uh, uh, European NATO is not really a serious part of it. It's basically U.S. Army, U.S. Armed Forces primarily getting involved there, like basically deploying uh, some classic cadre units of the U.S. Army, U.S. Ground Forces, and U.S. Air Force. 
And here where I have to disagree with the, uh, for example, McGregor, Duran, and even Brian Berlicic, because uh, as I always stay, state, and here I am again on the record, the whole thing, the whole warfare, the same as our lives, it's the matter of probabilities. Is it possible that the United States will get involved directly? That means deploys its armed forces against Russia in Ukraine. Possible. How probable it is, it is a completely different story. It could be a <clears throat> very low probability, most likely, you know, and I'm talking about very low probability. And the question is not uh, only about the, what um, we have to view the military history of the United States, which primarily fought second, third-rate opponents and avoids to fight head-on directly with their real peer or people who are better than peers. So... What's, what is going to be? Well, <clears throat> the reason, main reason, is not only that, well, obvious, uh, how to put it, aversion, if you wish, of the United States to fight a serious war, which it will lose, because, <clears throat> and the reason it's uh, going to lose is because, as I'm basically not just on record, as I already state, I write about this non-stop for eight years. United States simply doesn't have force structure and if you wish one can use also TOE, a table of organization and equipment, to fight real war. <clears throat> you may say, huh, what is the force structure? So <clears throat> because we're speaking the we're speaking in English here I want to present to you before I go into the force structure uh, some things which um, people from Rand, Mr. Rachmanik in 2017 was projecting what it would take for the United States uh, to basically <clears throat> uh, deal with Russia in order to defeat it in terms of the uh, air assets. Basically it all came down in 2017 with him calculating that you will have around so we have what uh, so, so 60 some uh, um, air wings and which amounted to something like 672, I don't remember, you can look it up and you can calculate it considering the air, not air wing, the squadron being uh, basically 12 uh, combat airplanes. And for some reason he thought that at, you know, those around 600, 700 uh, combat airplanes and support planes will be enough to defeat Russia. Obviously in 2019 he changed very much his uh, basically uh, tune and admitted in one of the in 2019 in one of the conferences held by Rand that we lose a lot of people in real war we lose a lot of equipment we usually fail to achieve our objectives of preventing aggression by the adversary Rand analyst David Oshmanek told a security conference on Thursday in our games when we fight Russia and China blue gets its ass handed to it it was the revelation and obviously pretty fast change of his opinions on the uh, air operations uh, against Russia and China, let alone both of them. And it went very nicely with this thing that the Air Force, the U.S. Air Force isn't dominant anymore, says the Air Force Chief of Staff. Obviously, it was uh, uh, 2020 and many people will say, oh, you know what, they are basically fishing for money and they try to present the, the, their weaknesses as the reason and as the basically impetus for Congress to provide more money. Well, it, let's not forget that uh, there is a little bit more to it than just merely squeezing money from the uh, purse, American purse. Brown believes that the U.S. will face World War II level losses against an advanced adversary like Russia or China. And here, actually, I have to admit with Brown, the chief of staff of the U.S. Air Force at that time, and here we go to this the level of attrition, and I will come back to the issue of the force structure. And I want to remind you one very simple thing which uh, many people still do not understand, being completely drowned, which is totally natural for people who are basically 
without serious military background and not military professionals, they are completely drowned in the, all those minutia, tactical minutia of, you know, something blew up here, something, you know, somebody died there, they killed this and that, and, well, yeah, it's important because it obviously allows you to build the picture from the below upward and have the more or less operational, so to speak, of view of the events, but again, most of the time it stays in the same, this Hollywood type level, explosions, you know, people dying, tanks and being blown up and airplanes shot down. In reality, of course, operations are always numbers, and you know this, it's statistics and a lot of probabilities. But, but, here is the very important thing. And this is the screenshot of the video a year ago. Well, actually, <clears throat> just before the uh, uh, February 24 and the start of the uh, special military operation where uh, Colonel Wilken, Wilkerson, the chief of staff of Colin Powell, speaking to of, uh, with two journalists from the Scrum, whatever that uh, resource is, and he sp they spoke about him, what is the possibility or probability of the United States getting involved and what it will end up uh, with. And he was pretty straightforward. You can look up this video and listen to all 45 minutes of that when he stated what will be the losses of the United States. He said if the United States really gets into the serious conventional combined arms conflict with Russia, the first week probably will see about 40,000 casualties on the American side. And those people just literally, you know, ran out of breath when he told them this. But again, this is also well within the um, assessments on and the attrition assessments in case of the real conflict, when Russia involves all of her armed forces, not this 10-15%, and goes for mobilization, then yes, then the United States will have the, that type of the losses uh, basically in the first week. And we know already by the even a limited special military operation, which is still being done in the white gloves primarily in order to avoid a lot of civilian <coughs> casualties that the losses of the Ukrainian armed forces or rather NATO forces which have some Ukrainian formations you know mixed uh, there between them uh, are horrendous so they are really high extremely high and again this is not the war and I will explain why it is not the war a little bit later but again this is not really really war because war are fought on a different level in terms of the even the manuals operation tactical and others which involved yes I'm sorry guys totally different numbers including the numbers of the civilian casualties so that is why the special military operation of course but of course in reality it is some kind of war and it's basically the largest combined arms operation since you know what probably Korea so and here what uh, I want to go back to this uh, uh, so to speak uh, for structure and why United States uh, uh, doesn't have the force structure for finding Russia. We will start with this. Obviously, there is no better source for explaining this than Congressional Budget Office for our English-speaking Anglophone population, and because obviously I speak English too, however bad. And if we can start looking at the Congressional Budget Office, they use military force structure, a primer, 2020 to uh, uh, 2021 update for the Congress, and here they explain what force structure is uh, and how to define it and what it involves. And if you uh, pretend yourself being a congress uh, a congressman or a congresswoman or congressional staffer with degree in say political science or journalism so <clears throat> that our uh, document becomes very important and so let's take a look at <coughs> how congressional budget office gives the definition of the um for structure and here it is what is for structure they ask the question and <clears throat> they basically say that all the DOD Department of Defense has many responsibilities and functions at the most basic level. It is the organization responsible for many equipping and training U.S. military forces. The vast majority of DOD funding and personnel are assigned to tasks that contribute in some way to producing military forces that are prepared for combat. 
And as such, DOD uh, can be viewed as an organization that converts inputs of funding and personnel into outputs of combat capability, which are then available to be used at the nas- as the nation see fit. That combat capability is the best described in terms of the number and types of combat units that DOD can generate and sustain, that is, in terms of force structure. And here it is. Well, basically, force structure is the uh, combination of units and uh, other forces and uh, other parts which uh, constitute the combat capability of the nation. And here they are. Here is the what Congressional uh, uh, Research uh, uh, of, uh, Congressional Budget Office writes. There is no generally <clears throat> agreed upon way to measure combat capability directly and quantitatively. Force structure is the simplest and uh, least subjective way to describe combat capability, although it has many limitations. The most significant drawback is that the concept of force structure inevitably invites apple to oranges comparisons such as how many aircraft carriers provide the same combat capability as the armored brigade. This is an excellent singling out of the problem of the force structure because indeed, how can you compare this? How can you view this? Well, and this is where the force structure gets into the hands of the military professionals who begin based on their tactical, operational, and strategic education, and primarily engineer military engineering degrees, which deal with the weapon systems, begin to kind of figure out what will be the actual impact, combat impact, of units available to the United States are not very useful when you count them if you do not consider the quality of those units. The same issue arises in any comparison of the four structures of different militaries. A U.S. Armors Brigade may have far more uh, combat power, particularly when combined with its support units, than that of another country. But, and they bring here a very important question, and uh, I've been speaking about this when I was making my videos about the operations, how you uh, calculate it, how you provide uh, accurate, uh, you know, uh, well, accurate to a degree uh, uh, calculations for the required force, which of course involves this whole idea of the force structure. Just to give you an example, yes, Brigade Combat Team of American, uh, for example, Armored Division could be a very powerful force until you begin to compare for what theater, especially having the M1 Abrams tanks, which are what, in excess of 67 or whatever tons, just humongous rumbling piece of armor, which probably will not fit, let's say, half of the bridges in uh, in Europe, if you fight uh, to do in Europe. And then, of course, you have the uh, basically troops or army air defense in the United States, which is simply non-existent compared, for example, to the same with Russia. And when you begin to compare, the is you begin to look at the numbers of the fire impact and tactical and operational impact and you begin to look at the outcomes which may not be actually that conducive or for that matter favorable <coughs> for, for the United States Army. And we can take a look at what United States Army in terms of force structure is reported by the Congressional Budget Office. Look at this. Here's the number, size, and cost of selected U.S. forces 2021 to 2025. So it's a very fresh uh, numbers, and they explain to you how many of what and personnel and how many formations which constitute this force they have. And you can look at this and you can say, ah, okay. So we can take a look at, for example, carrier air wings. We have the 11 aircraft carriers, many of which are still not available during the actual war. You still can push out of the the sea, but without even a serious shakedown. But here we have, you have carrier air wing, nine of them. You have, for example, 72 early Burke class destroyers, and you have 53 attack submarines. And I spoke about those numbers a little bit, for example, when I was speaking a few uh, days ago about submarine development, both Russia and United States, for example. Then you have the fighter squadrons, which is, as I already stated, if you look attentively, notional squadron of 12 aircraft. Actual squadrons vary in size, yes. They could range between 10 to 16 sometimes, but generally it's 12 squadrons. In Russian, for example, it's called Eskadrilya, and uh, basically air regiment is 24. Traditionally, um, 
combat uh, tactical aircraft. So as you can see yourself, you have 41 uh, um, uh, uh, fighter squadrons for F-16. They give you a little bit uh, primary F-16. Of course, you have some F-15. You have some something which is really not a serious aircraft, F-35s, if they fly and when they fly. But generally, you begin to get at this. And when you begin to count numbers of the equipment, and you begin to count numbers of the personnel, which actually theoretically can get involved in Russia, with Russia in Ukraine, and try to get involved in NATO in a sort of serious way, you begin to recognize that the numbers are not there. People say, oh, United States has 100,000 people, let's say, uh, deployed right now in Europe. Well, for starters, these 100,000 are not necessarily linear first-line troops. They are very many service personnel, so to speak, auxiliary, uh, um, basically uh, uh, part of it, which serves all kinds of functions from being cooks to servicing equipment for the number of the installation, including like Rammstein Air Base and things of this nature. So those are not frontline troops, which will not uh, basically uh, fight. If you look at the combat, uh, again, brigade combat team, which United States offers, uh, Division may have like one to two, well, having division in the United States can grow up to 25,000 uh, personnel. But if, if you look at the personnel which is involved in brigade combat team, uh, it's about 4,400, as you saw yourself in the Congressional Budget Office. And you begin to put those things together, even if the United States begins to deploy all of its available ground forces and air forces available for the war in Europe right now, and with that, it can say that oh, okay some Europeans will also uh, basically add uh, to all of that you will still recognize that Russia which showed to you actually how fast to mobilize 300 plus thousand personnel can mobilize another 2 million personnel which also have and uh, during the shakedown they will use the what is the reserved number of the both tanks artillery pieces and even aircraft and you recognize that Russia will have at least equal if not much larger uh, uh, not only personnel but equipment uh, uh, force structure if you if we use this term and uh, considering Russia overwhelming advantage in terms of the air defense and stand of weapons which is the whole other story by now we don't know how many thousands of missiles and stand of weaponry have been used which would overwhelm a uh, any kind of any iteration of the NATO air defense. So you begin to get the idea of what it could be in the real fight. And that is why NATO, well, Europeans is a separate story. But I mean, United States still has issues with contemplating the real thing. I'm not talking about David Petraeus, who proposed this, the coalition of the willing. I am not sure that he is militarily competent on this level. The guy was, well, he was competent in completely different matters of screwing pretty non-attractive women. But other than that, I mean, come on, we're talking about people who really do not have any experience fighting of the modern war, including the modern war where the American, in case of a real war, American air and space-based assets will be uh, mostly wiped out of the orbit and obviously from the skies. And uh, this is the uh, basically circumstances, conditions, which, for example, Petrescu has very little understanding of, uh, of despite his uh, basically education from whatever, I mean, U.S. Military Academy in West Point and then uh, General Staff and Command College in Leavenworth, Kansas. So, I mean, he never commanded anything like this. Russian generals command this all the time. So, and there you go. And so you want to begin to look at this, you will understand that, yeah, even in terms of artillery, let alone in terms of logistics, which is ab absolutely a must, Russia outproduces already now the United States and NATO. And that is why when you look at this force structure, you see that apart from purely technological issue of the combat capability, as I already gave you example, for example, uh, uh, with the air defense or stand of weapons, NATO is not a competitor anymore or in the real conventional uh, combined arms 
war and we talk about a real war when Russia goes and indeed goes and the full blown military footing. Uh, United States and NATO combined cannot do that. There is no economic capability to do this. And I'm talking about the real industrial capability. And this is the issue which many people do not believe and then cannot comprehend, cannot grasp it. And but this is the one which needs to be addressed, and I was addressing it partially before. I will continue to address it. In other words, they don't have numbers. They don't have numbers, which are of course of quality, and you need to have quality. Obviously, that is why uh, 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 capability and combat capability is calculated as some kind of fusion of both numbers and quality. Numbers themselves do not necessarily translate into the capability, but when combined properly with the military doctrine and the way things are designed and used, and we go there from across the board, including the moral and psychological factor, then there you go. And this is my statement on this, that NATO doesn't have now what it takes to really fight a real war. And of course, the only war they can theoretically fight is the nuclear one. But after that, it won't matter anyhow who won or lost because there will be no winners. I mean, primarily uh, the human civilization will cease to exist. And this is what I wanted to give you, kind of primer that, yeah, NATO theoretically can try uh, it's not going to go well for it, and uh, if it tries like this, of course, we have to also start thinking in terms of the uh, shipping lanes of communication, uh, because the United States needs to do the strategic sea lift and move all those ships across Atlantic, and yeah, for those who don't know, Russia has a pretty decent uh, navy and some submarines which are arguably the best in the world. So. There you go, you need to consider this too. And so when you begin to go into this, one has to ask the question, what and how are they going to be deploying to fight Russia? I can tell you, the only thing they will be deploying will be Polish troops. So Poland is uh, basically conducting now mobilization. They probably will get 200,000 people. Yeah, they will have those Abrams and Patriots. Good luck with that. But Russia, obviously, and once the Poland gets involved, obviously, uh, Belarus gets involved. And Belarus has a decent army of you know, ground forces about 75,000 people, they have the air component, air defense, and things of this nature. So, the United States obviously needs this conflict to drag out, but, but as long as Russia is not in a complete war footing, uh, Russia is fine, and Russia will continue to basically slaughter uh, the um, huge numbers of the armed forces of Ukraine, remnants, and obviously NATO troops which are involved in, in the war in Ukraine, and uh, until Russians decide to move big time strategically. And that's when we'll see how it all goes. Now, in, in conclusion, I want to tell you this, that we cannot obviously avoid mentioning this whole thing. And uh, as you can see yourself, um, it's good. I think so. It was the best uh, well, uh, New Year and uh, Christmas present for Russians when you have the European um, leadership, so to speak, and uh, elite. I, I cannot call them really elite, but all those, you know, shysters, be that Merkel or Holland, who said that uh, 2014 Minsk agreement was indeed a ploy to buy Ukraine time and should be credited for Kyiv's successful resilience. Now, former French President François Holland said on Friday, confirming former German Chancellor Angela Merkel's assessment of the truce, Holland also blamed U.S. weakness for the failure to deter Russia. Well, Holland is not even a serious man or serious politician, but, you know, um, what can I say? I mean, it's good. I, I like it that finally the masks are completely off. And for those people who continue to um, basically uh, speculate that Putin, uh, collective Putin and Russia did know what it was all about. No, it's all wrong. Russians knew it all along. And all events starting from around 2012 will tell you that Russia was getting ready for this clash. And uh, at this particular case, what can I say? <clears throat> I am not privy to the top-notch, top-secret information about what is going on in terms of the continued mobilization, as some people suggested, in Russia. But I think so. At some point of time, we can expect Russian, uh, uh, basically, offensive uh, for 
what we assume to be uh, the main uh, geographic objective of taking the coastal Ukraine. And now, well, the slaughter continues, I'm sorry, and the attrition warfare, well, if anybody wants to really fight this attrition warfare, as Mr. Uh, what his name, Melbourne, the Colonel of US Marine Corps, at least that's what he tries to present himself, stated on during his uh, drunk talk, about his Mozart company and how it was operating in Ukraine, it is pretty much screwed up, uh, effed up, you know, uh, nation, effed up country, and yeah, this is not the war any Western military encountered in a very long time. Namely, I would say at least Korea, but primarily World War II, and even then it was against the pale shadow of the Wehrmacht. So this is what I wanted to tell you today, and again, it's by far not everything, but hey, I have to start something uh, with something in this new year, and as always, guys, those who like what I do, please subscribe to my channel and support me on Patreon, or buy me a coffee, and I really appreciate your support. Thank you very much, and I'll be talking to you later. Bye-bye.